Get this like, is the French Revolution oversimplified. This looks good. This has been my recommended forever, and I haven't watched it, so I want to watch it. So I said to the Marquis de la Fufayette, what do you think I am? Some dirty peasant? I've never worked a day in my life. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that Marie Antoinette sure is pretty. Sure is. Wouldn't want to be Prince Louis, though. That's going to be a lot of responsibility when he becomes king, especially since France is in financial ruin. Quite. Thank you one and all for attending the royal marriage of my grandson, the future king of France, to the Archduchess of Austria. Now for the very awkward yet historically accurate part of the ceremony, where we all watch him get into bed together. <laughs> really? <laughs> all right, now that's out of the way. Let's leave the royal couple to it. You better give us an air, you fat, ill-bred boy. <laughs> Nighty night. That's going to be a lot of responsibility. France is in financial ruin. <laughs> you fat, ill-bred boy. Quite. That's going to be a lot of responsibility. France is in financial ruin. He's got acne on his mouth. Oh, great. He's a freaking weirdo. <laughs> France, the most prosperous, cultured, and beautiful nation in the world, as it had been for centuries. An exquisite social culture, with the king and the upper classes throwing crazy parties every night, enjoying high living and fine dining. Who cares that they were only able to do so off the backs of the hard-working, starving poor? What are they going to do? Revolt? They're only 80% of the population. Ha! No. Life in France is great. What's that, France? You want to go to war with Britain and increase your power? Ooh, go for that it, sounds fun. Buddy. You do you. And you lost. Now you're in <laughs> severe financial debt. We have no money. What do we do? Should we stop partying? Heck no. Party harder. That's okay. Nice. The peasantry will pick up the slack. They were created by God to do all the work, and you were created to reap all the benefits and party hard. That's just how society works, and we've all just accepted it <laughs> for centuries. Why? Why what? Why do the nobility get to be all rich and stuff? just because they were born into it? And the rest of us schmucks just have to accept that? Hell, why do we even need a king? Who decided that? It all just seems very unfair and unequal, and I, for one, am starting to question it. Wow, that's very enlightened of you. <clears throat> and so began the Age of Enlightenment. <laughs> Great philosophical thinkers across France and beyond began to question whether this beautiful nation was really all that beautiful after all, hey Prince Louis, bad news. Your grandpa died of smallpox this morning, Sad. which means good news, you're now the king. So just to sum up, France is in severe financial debt Oof. and the angry populace are beginning to question how necessary you are. But hey, I believe in you, champ. You got this. I Maybe. bet he saves France. Oh no. <laughs> Prince Louis Capet became King Louis the 16th in May 1774. He was a notoriously weak man and he knew it. He barely had the wisdom to rule a nation, never mind one in crisis, and he was easily manipulated by those around him. One of his first acts was to try to get revenge on the British by financing their American colony's revolution. Hey, we're an independent nation now. Nice. That was real swell of you, Louis. Couldn't have done it without you. Glad I could help. So hey, about all that money we lent you, when can we get that back? Yep, you're a great guy. I'll never forget what you've done for us. Real glad I could help, friend, but about that money. You gotta go now, chum. Best of luck to you. <laughs> Man, I'm glad. Uh, as an American, I guess I'm pretty fucking glad this guy <laughs> didn't know what the fuck he's doing. <laughs> that helped a lot. We definitely would have lost Revolutionary War without France's support and warships. That would have been, that would have been, there would have been no shot. No. And now France was in even more debt. Get scammed, France's son. Poor, suffering under the strain of economic ruin, watched as the nobility continued to live as though nothing was wrong. In particular, they grew increasingly disdainful of the queen, Marie Antoinette, as she continued to spend all of France's money on her own luxurious lifestyle and fashion. While the peasants were breaking their backs in the fields, she was walking around like, hey, my hair is a boat. I'm not making that up. Her hair really was a boat. <laughs> and her lavish spending earned her the nickname Madame Deficit. And speaking of the Queen, Stop. there was also a long-standing scam. Imagine trying to give a speech on austerity <laughs> when your hair's a boat. We all need to tighten our belts. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a tough couple seasons. <laughs> and we're going to need to really pull it together to keep France afloat. <laughs> It's like my, my boat-like hair. Scandal around the fact that the king took a very long time to boink her, and the working classes of Paris began ridiculing the royal couple with lewd pamphlets depicting the queen as a court thought. 
and the king is a wuss, unable to fulfill his marital duty. Respect for the monarchy was at an all-time low, as Damn, Francis' when you finances get fucking were spiraling roasted over out of pamphlet? control, That's tough. and the king and his aides really only had one solution to the crisis. Tax the poor. Tax the poor. We could do a sexy calendar shoot. Uh, I mean, tax the poor. Nice. And so it was. The poor, who were already struggling to make ends meet, found themselves being taxed from every direction. Hey, I'm the royal tax collector. Looks like you've yet to pay your income tax, head tax. By the way, how many windows you got in that house of yours? Um, three? Oof, yep. There's gonna be a tax for that. Hey, your local priest here. Have you paid your church tithe yet? Well, at least this one is going to the good work of God. Sure. God. I think this year, God wants me to buy a new swimming pool. Hey, private tax collector here. Oh, and I brought some goons with me. Just a few quick questions. How much salt did you buy this year? About seven kilos, I think? Yep. Okay, there's gonna be a tax for that. Oh, what's that over there? And that's extra salt I held over from last year, so I wouldn't have to buy as much this year. Oh, yep, there's a tax for that. <laughs> um, and what are you doing with all this salt? Well, obviously cooking. Mm-hmm. On the table. Yep. And preserving fish and meat. Oh, oh no. Yep, <laughs> and there's a tax for that. Hey, how old is he? He's nine. And so he's purchased his required amount of salt for this year, right? What? No, he's nine. Uh-oh, <laughs> sorry, little Timmy. Looks like I'm gonna have to tax you for that. <laughs> That's deserved, though, right? I mean, like, come on, this kid's not... Yep, salty. There's going to be a tax for that. And that's not all. A huge portion of the peasants' harvest had to be given up. And there was also the labor tax, where peasants were required to work a certain number of days for their local lord without pay. That's Obviously, insane. people weren't too happy with these taxation <laughs> policies. And the aggressive nature of these private tax farmers sometimes even escalated to violence. In particular, though, the people really hated how inconsistent the taxation rules were across the nation. And also the fact that the first two estates often had to pay very little, if any tax. Anyone getting a sense of deja vu? Surely there's no parallels to today. Surely there's no fucking in comparison to how taxation works right now at all and so the anger continued to grow france had a population that was just about ready to explode what could push them over the edge how about a touch of natural disaster a series of harsh summers and winters left the peasants harvests in ruin meaning they had no food or money and the cost of bread skyrocketed of course the upper classes had massive stocks of grain and wheat so they were virtually nice. untouched by this new crisis but now the poor really were starving and they began to riot women took to the streets bakeries were raided and bakers suspected of keeping bread for themselves were sometimes even hanged Jeez. wow this is really getting out of control your majesty we need some decisive action you need to step up and lead us what will you do Okay, okay, I've got this. I know. I'll summon the estates general, and they'll decide what to do. You really are a fat, ill-bred boy. <laughs> the estates general was the closest thing France had to a government apart from the king. It was a purely advisory body and was rarely summoned. In fact, it hadn't been summoned for 175 years prior Jesus. to this. But with France in a severe crisis, the king felt the time was right to call on the government to help. The estates general was made up of representatives from the three estates, that is, the clergy, the nobility, and everybody else. Okay, thanks for coming, everyone. The first order of business is regarding the clergy and nobility. You all get brand new Porsches. Nice! You get a Porsche, and you get a Porsche, <laughs> and you get a Porsche. <laughs> everybody gets a Porsche. And now into the second order of business. France is completely out of money. Like, <laughs> it's never been this bad before. Anyone got any ideas? How about we all get Lamborghinis next time? <laughs> the king decided that in order to make a decision, they had to come up with a voting system. Okay, the clergy. You have a population of 130,000, so you'll get one vote. The nobility. You have a population of 350,000, so you'll also get one vote. And the third estate. You have a population of 27 million people and make up 98% of the population. Very yeah. impressive. You'll get one vote. The third estate were obviously pretty unhappy with this system because they kept on finding that this would happen. We propose to raise taxes on the third estate. All in favor? All opposed? Two to one. Taxes will be raised on the third estate. We propose a motion that says the first two estates are a bunch of poo-poo heads. All in favor? All opposed? Two to one. It's official. We are not 
poo poo heads. All right, well, that's democracy. That's democracy. All right, you can't you can't argue with that reform the vote. Be outvoted by the two upper estates, and they thought that was kind of lame. So they decided that since they were 98% of the population, they could go off to form their own government, make their own laws, and take over the running of the country. And so the National Assembly was born. The third estate was now in control, and there was nothing the king could do to stop. Ha ha! I've locked you all out of your building. What are you gonna do about it? We'll probably go find a different building that isn't locked. <laughs> oh, no. That was the, the big Assembly plan. did find another unlocked building <laughs> just down the road, an indoor tennis court. Where on the 20th of June, 1789, they all took the tennis court oath, pledging to continue meeting until the king finally gave into their demands for more equality and economic reform. This new National Assembly included many of the most educated members of the Third Estate, including two young lawyers by the names of Maximilien Robespierre and Georges Danton. Some members of the first two estates even joined their cause. Some of these men formed a radical new political party called the Jacobin Club and quickly became leading figures. While many members of the Third Estate simply wanted more equality, a growing number in this Jacobin faction would begin calling for something even crazier, the removal of the king entirely. Ooh. And this is where fear began to take hold. How the hell are you going to live without a king? Really? No king. It, it won't work. It doesn't make sense. Who's going to be at the top, you know? Let's hear about, though. Tell situation developing, everyone was afraid. Let's not of lose our heads over this whole no king his thing. His position was under threat, and he called in the military to take position around Paris. The third estate heard rumor of the gathering military force, and they feared the king was planning to round them up and arrest them. Maybe he'd even execute them. It also didn't help that the king had just dismissed France's popular finance minister, who had been trying to make reforms himself. It seemed the king was done negotiating. Fear, left unchecked, often boils over into anger, and mm. anger detonates with violence. The angry people of Paris, after centuries of cruel inequality, harsh oppression, even starvation, fearful of having their new movement for reform demolished so soon, decided that it was now or never to take action. Screw reform. They decided they'd do one better. How about revolution? The people of Paris, believing the French military was preparing to attack, decided they should arm themselves. The National Assembly announced the creation of a bourgeois militia, the National Guard, and immediately, many troops from the French military defected over to the revolutionary side. In the early hours of July 14th, 1789, a large crowd stormed and raided the Hotel des Invalides, a military hospital where they were able to secure a large number of rifles. The bad news was they weren't able to find any gunpowder for their new weapons. The good news was they knew exactly where to get some. A prison fortress and a symbol of royal tyranny towering over Bastille Paris, Day! The Bastille. Mid-morning, the crowd gathered around the Bastille and demanded that the man in charge, Governor Delaunay, surrender the prison and hand over the gunpowder. Yeah. Obviously, Governor Delaunay... <laughs> he was a looker. <laughs> How could he be evil with a face like that? Yes, there are two horns beginning to protrude from his head, but... Delaunay, surrender the prison Cute and hand over fucking... the gunpowder. Obviously, Governor Delaunay was like, no way. So he stalled for time by inviting a few members of the crowd in for negotiations. The crowd, still waiting outside, quickly became impatient, and before long, they stormed the fortress, taking on the French troops inside. Your Majesty, we've received word that the people have surrounded the Bastille. Governor Delaunay will hold them off. No need to worry. Actually, Your Majesty, it appears the crowd is now headed away from the Bastille. You see? What did I tell you? Clearly, Governor Delaunay has defeated them and has them on the run. No need to worry. Uh, Your Majesty, isn't that Governor Delaunay's head on a pike? Well... <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, Governor Delaunay has taken on the form of a bodiless pikehead deity, and the people are so enamored with him, they're parading him around the city. No of need course. to worry at all. Oh, when the National course. Assembly heard about the violence that had taken place, they had two options. Either one, they denounce it and try to carry on the revolution using peaceful means, or two, they say, damn, you stuck his head on a pike? That's pretty hardcore. And we love it. Incidentally, they went with option number two. Some historians believe this reaction paved the way for the utter violence and bloodshed that would become the legacy of the French Revolution. Yeah. <laughs> this widespread acceptance of violence during the revolution is also turn. largely credited to the writings of a certain Jean-Paul Marat, a man of science with a horrible skin condition that kept him confined to a bathtub. He began writing a radical newspaper he affectionately named The Friend of the People. Citizens of France, be very afraid. Given the chance, the king and the nobility won't hesitate to massacre us all. The solution is simple. Execute them. 
This is crazy. This is like having your entire ideology <laughs> defined by the crazy guy in the YouTube comments. You know what I'm saying? He is the equivalent of just some psycho in the in the Reddit. Like the, the paragraph Andy on Reddit. He's the LSF Andy. And he just writes like fucking crazy. Everyone's like, yeah, well, <laughs> take it as fact. Kill every last one of them. Cut off a thousand heads. And if that's not enough, cut off a thousand more. Oh, hey, Mr. Squeaky. What are you doing down there? You're so cute. <laughs> Got a soft Aww, side, I love you too, Mr. Squeaky. Mwah. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Kill them all. It became one of the most popular publications in Paris during the revolution and succeeded in spreading ever-increasing fear and anger among the people. In August, leaders of the National Assembly, with help from a certain Thomas Jefferson, adopted the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizens, nice. an incredible document that guaranteed liberty and equal rights to all men. And when I say men, I mean men. Despite its glaring shortcomings nice. in gender equality, the massively influential declaration would go on to inspire the struggle for liberty and equality across the planet for centuries. However, back in France, the vast majority of the people weren't really Starving so concerned smart. with enlightened ideas of equality <laughs> as much as they were concerned with the fact that they were still starving. Bread was still expensive as hell and hard to come by. The people felt that one reason nothing had been done yet about the crisis was because the king simply couldn't see the problem. He lived in Versailles, a full 20 kilometers southwest of Paris, and as a result, lived in comfort, separated from his dirty, stinking subjects. On October 5th, a crowd of women, 7,000 strong, decided they'd do something unprecedented. They decided they'd remove that separation and confront the king directly. Oh, shit. The women marched all the way to the king's palace in Versailles. Along the way, they the crowd 20? continued to grow into the tens of thousands, and when they arrived, they demanded an audience with the king. What are those things outside the palace? They're poor people, your majesty. That's poor people? <laughs> they say they're hungry. Hungry? Then let them eat cake. Wow. See, this is the exact BS that led to this whole mess in the first place. You're so out of touch. They're writhing around in the filth, breaking their back to barely scrape by, and they come to you demanding just the basic ability to feed themselves, and you think a slice of cake will sort them out? Well... Then let them eat Taco Bell Crunch Wrap Supreme. That would have worked. How do I? Wow. <laughs> They're not, not too long ago. that desperate. <laughs> Members of the crowd actually managed are good. to break into the palace with the intention of killing the queen, who narrowly escaped through a secret passage in her bedroom. The enraged mob killed several members of the royal guard and raised their heads on pikes, which Ooh. if you haven't noticed yet, is something they, they were quite fond the of doing. Thing. The king had no choice but to come out and talk to the crowd. He agreed to accept his new position, sharing power with the revolutionary government, and to return to Paris with the crowd, removing the separation between king and subject. <laughs> king Louis had a problem with people constantly raiding his palace, but one thing he didn't have a problem with was people raiding his computer. Because he used Muse. You can take a PN simply calm. Part two, part two, part two! King Louis and his family were now in the Tuileries Palace in Paris, where for the next couple of years, he watched as the revolutionary government began to strip away his this? power. And fearing 20 minutes? Snack pause! Snack pause and then we watch part two! Everyone get a snack! Get your snack, get your drink. We're gonna watch part two, but I wanna get a little snacky snack. For his safety, he had to stay on their good side. Hey, look who it is. It's my favorite revolutionaries. Yep, I'm your number one fan. What can I do for you? Hey, King Louis, so we've made a few decisions. First, all of your friends in the nobility are gonna have to pay taxes the same as everyone else. Great idea. I love it. And as a side note, the tax money can no longer pay for all your lavish parties. Great. I hate those parties. <laughs> They're so awkward. And also, we're taking away your Porsche. Oh, come on! I mean... Yay. <laughs> the king continually found demand after demand being made of him to prove his support for the revolution. On one occasion, a mob would invade the palace and demand he wear the revolutionary bonnet. This is the face of a man who is definitely pretending he wants to wear that bonnet. <laughs> now around here, I want to mention that one thing King Louis had a problem with was people constantly raiding his palace. But one thing he didn't have a problem with was raiding noobs on this video's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> now where was I? Oh yeah. Seeing the situation rapidly turning against him, the king decided it might be a good idea to leave France and mount a campaign to retake his country from abroad. Luckily for him, he was married to an Austrian. So on the night of June 20th, 1791, the king and his family disguised themselves as servants and attempted to flee to the Austrian Netherlands. Kind of smart, right? The royal carriage made a stop in the town of Varennes, and the postmaster there was like, Hey guys, what's up? Where are you off to? We are but a collection of inconspicuous servants heading for the border in for no royal particular carriage? reason at all. <laughs> Say, you, the fat one, you look kind of familiar. 
Aren't you the king? Nope. Let me see your passport. It says here you're King Louis the Sixteenth. Nope, not me. Take him away, boys. The king was promptly returned to Damn, Paris. Tried. But now, the jig was up. His lack of support for the revolution was clear to all, and many considered him a straight-up traitor who tried to abandon his people. As a result, the new constitution of 1791 completely reduced his powers to that of a simple figurehead, a constitutional monarch. However, radicals, such as those in the Jacobin Club, were outraged that the king wasn't to be removed entirely. So a month later, these radicals staged a protest on the Champ du Mars calling for the king's removal. The government of Paris feared an insurrection was mounting, and they sent the military to disperse the crowd. The confrontation escalated and resulted in the revolution. Wait, someone said fun fact. He was recognized because his face was on coins in France back then. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. You imagine someone holding up the fucking money. Bro, that's you. You are the spitting image of this. Did anyone, you ever get that? You look just like the fucking guy on our coin. Revolutionary National Guard firing on a crowd of revolutionaries. It was a massacre. The incident exposed a deep division within the Brotherhood of the Revolution. On one side, the moderates who wanted to keep the king as a figurehead. On the other, radicals who wanted to see the king deposed and heads roll. In the wake of the massacre, these radicals received a wave of support. And speaking of rolling heads, one form of equality the revolution introduced was equality in execution. This meant no more torturous drawing and quartering, no more inhumane hanging. They wanted all criminals, regardless of economic status, to receive the same penalty, a quick and painless one. Luckily, a man by the name of Dr. Joseph Guillotine had an idea. A heavy blade that falls like thunder, the head flies off, blood spurts, and the man is no more. The guillotine, otherwise known as the National Razor. The guillotine made its debut in 1790. I did not know that it was named after a guy named guillotine. That's crazy. Me and Ludwig were off stream talking about this guy. Forget his name now, but he's the he was like the hang he was like the executioner for France for like three decades, and he executed like thousands of people. John Sanson. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure, no, he's mentioned about it. We talked about it on stream afterwards, but off stream, we were just in a call. We were just trolling Wikipedia together with Stans. And Stans can be like, shut the fuck up. And we kept talking about John Sanson. And he had like the most crazy life. He won as the new form of execution. The writings of Marat and others continued to call for the execution of anyone suspected of working against the revolution. For him, this included some members of the clergy and nobility who had previously benefited from the cruel system of inequality that existed before the revolution. In many parts of the countryside, local lords had found themselves become a target. Sire, the peasants, they're revolting. Oh, come on, that's a bit harsh. Sure, they smell a bit, but I wouldn't say they're revolting. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Increasingly, these French aristocrats began fleeing France to find solitude in other parts of Europe. And once again, fear began to take hold. The privileged classes of these foreign nations didn't like what they were seeing because they feared revolutionary ideas may spread to their own lands. The National Assembly, actually now the Legislative Assembly, feared that these nations may decide to attack. Then why don't we attack them first? No, you idiots, we are definitely not ready for war yet. Did somebody say something? France declared war in Austria in April 1792 and immediately got pummeled. It also didn't help that Austria's ally, Prussia, joined in the fighting. The Prussian Duke of Brunswick posted a letter warning the revolutionaries that if anything happened to the king, he would burn Paris to the ground. The Duke's letter proved to be a massive success in inspiring the people of Paris to do the exact opposite of what he intended. They were enraged by the threat, and on the 10th of August, 1792, the tension in the city exploded, and a mob stormed the king's palace. Fighting broke out between the revolutionaries and the king's Swiss guard, with casualties in the hundreds. King Louis fled and took refuge in the chamber of the Legislative Assembly, where Robespierre and his radical Jacobins were gaining ever more power. Given the developing situation, the chamber decided to hold a vote, and in what some considered to be a second revolution, it was decided to suspend the monarchy entirely. King Louis the 16th Damn. was now just plain old Louis, and he was sent to a prison cell where an eye could be kept on him. A month later, the newly established National Convention officially declared the French Republic, and society underwent a massive change. Enlightened ideas of democracy and equality were being implemented, but very quickly, these ideas seemed to become secondary to fear, paranoia, 
and a thirst for blood. The New Republic began working to violently remove any semblance of the old royalist regime. The church became a prime target. Priests who refused to take an oath to the revolution were deported or arrested. A new state-sponsored atheistic religion named the Cult of Reason was created as a replacement for the Catholic Church. Notre Dame, along with many other churches, had their... They were the original neckbeards? They were the original Redditors? Dude, they let their entire fucking ideology get corrupted by Redditors? Religious treasures destroyed and were converted to temples of reason. Even the Christian calendar didn't survive, as a brand new revolutionary calendar was soon introduced. Hey, honey, I'm home. Yeah, whatever, jerk. Whoa, what's wrong with you? You forgot. Forgot what? Everything. This entire year. My birthday was on the 3rd of Germinal. Our anniversary was the 12th of Thermidor, and you promised that in Freimare, we'd go on a romantic weekend trip to Venice. No, I said we'd do that in December. December hasn't been a thing for years. The government of Paris, now under the control of the radical saint culotte, began rounding up suspected enemies of the revolution and sending them to prison in the thousands. Naturally, a large number of those arrested were members of the clergy and aristocracy. As France's foreign enemies continued to close in, panic spread. Georges Danton made impassioned calls for men to defend the Republic, and tens of thousands of troops left Paris for the front lines. However, in their absence, Paris was left to its own devices. As enemy troops arrived in Verdun, the people of Paris feared that their crowded prisons were becoming a breeding ground for counter-revolutionary conspiracy. What would happen if the Prussians reached Paris and freed the aristocrats? Marat believed he knew what would happen. The aristocrats would enact their vengeance on the people. Fearing those they had already imprisoned, mobs descended on Paris's prisons. Wow. They broke in, and during the brutal That's September brutal. massacres, That's aristocrats, brutal. priests, and others were tried and executed on the spot. Even women and children weren't spared. With over 1,600 victims, word of the massacre spread across Europe. One British newspaper wondered, are these the rights of man? Is this the liberty of human nature? But there was still one man in particular that Robespierre and his radicals really wanted to see executed. Austria and Prussia pledged that after they defeated France, they'd return King Louis to the throne. Well, checkmate Austria and Prussia, because he can't return a man to the throne if he's already dead. Citizen Louis Capet was put on trial for treason. Obviously, he was found guilty, but his punishment was less certain. Many moderates wanted to simply deport him, but Robespierre insisted the revolution could only live if the king was dead. A vote was held, and by just one vote, Louis was sentenced oh, to the guillotine. If you don't mind, I'd like to say a few words first. Gentlemen, I am innocent of everything of which I am acute. Wait, you're too loud. <laughs> they can't hear me. Hang on, I haven't finished yet. Wait, dude. Uncool. In her prison cell, Marie Antoinette heard the guns fire, signaling her husband's death. Before long, she would meet the same fate. Back on the war front, France defied all expectations and actually managed to push the enemy back. But oh. then more countries joined the coalition against France, and it all went to pot again. What do we do? Conscript the masses! The National Convention introduced a conscription law, with each regional department having to meet a certain quota of men for the army. However, not everyone was happy with this new law. Of course. You see, while Paris was definitely a hotbed for radical revolutionary fervor, some of the regions outside of Paris weren't quite so keen on the revolution. Some were largely still conservative, still supported the church, and just didn't suffer from that much inequality before the revolution. So as the revolution turned increasingly violent and anti-Christian, many were outraged. Now, they were being conscripted to fight for the new republic they hated. That was the last straw. Counter-revolutionary uprisings erupted in a number of regions across France. Some would last for years, such as in the Northwest, where a large-scale uprising was led by the Owls. Why were they called the Owls? the Owls? Because their leader was named Jean Owl. Why was he called Jean Owl? Possibly because he could do a really good impression of an owl. Really? That's what we're going with? Owls? Just because this guy can do an impression of one? Hit him with it, Jean. Hoot, hoot. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> the Chouannerie uprising lasted all the way until 1800. In the summer of 1793, the southern city of Toulon invited the British Navy over for some tea and crumpets, and then they asked if they'd possibly like to stay and occupy the city. Being an important naval base, this was a heavy blow to the Republic, who sent a relatively unknown young captain by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte oh. to help stage a siege of the city. Toulon was recaptured by France in the winter, and for his service, Napoleon was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. 
The most infamous counter-revolution, however, he was occurred pretty young, in the Vendée right? region. Throughout 1793, revolutionary forces Big clashed nappy. with the region's Catholic and royal army. The Republic defeated the counter-revolution through cruel pacification. In particular, General Jean-Baptiste Carrier committed brutal atrocities. In one instance, he had thousands of civilians, priests, women, and children tied to ships, which were then sunk. Carrier would later... Sorry, what? <laughs> Wait, what? Did I hear that right? In one instance, he had thousands of civilians, priests, women, and thousands tied to ships, which were then sunk. Carrier would later be found guilty of war crimes. Yeah, wow, that's psychotic. What what was even the purpose? He tied a bunch of women and children to ships and then sunk them and in his own country? Back in Paris, the government was still dominated by moderates. With the war going badly, revolts in the provinces, and the economy getting worse, it seemed the government just wasn't doing a very good job. Radical's fear for the safety of the revolution intensified, and Marat even began calling for the moderates in the government to be executed. Bro, why are they still listening to him? The moderates called for the arrest of Marat. This led to a chain of events with the two sides in heated conflict. Robespierre declared the Jacobins to be an insurrection and called on the people to arm themselves. It all ended on the 31st of May, 1793, with the National Convention surrounded by radical Saint-Culotte and 29 moderate Girondin politicians arrested. From this moment on, the moderates ceased to be a political force. Robespierre and his radicals would be in almost total control of the government. And this brings us to the story of a woman named Charlotte Corday. Charlotte lived in the northwest city of Caen, and like many in the area, was horrified at the rapid radicalization and increasing violence of the revolution. And the man she blamed more than anyone was Jean-Paul Marat. Right. She wanted to bring peace back to France, and so she did something drastic. She traveled to Paris and told Marat she had a list of enemies for him to publish in his paper. Marat eagerly invited her in for a meeting. So where's that list of enemies you promised me? Here it is. Wait a minute. This isn't the list of enemies. It just says, yippee Kaye, mother- ah! Holy shit! And just like that, Marat was no more. Wait, that's what she happened? Was quickly arrested and sent to the guillotine. Her dream of restoring peace, however, died with her. Marat became a martyr. In Temples of Reason, symbols of the dead Marat became the new crucifix. In death, he became an even more powerful inspiration for the extreme levels of violence that were about to rip throughout the new Holy republic. Holy fuck! And that's right. Here comes I didn't the know reign this. of terror. If you thought this revolution already sounds pretty violent, well, you ain't seen nothing yet, son. The radicals were now in control, and they believed not only was France surrounded by foreign enemies, but that within the masses, there were also plenty of internal ones too. Individuals not loyal to the revolution conspiring to bring about its downfall. Robespierre and the rest of the radical faction were having none of it. A new paranoid. committee of public safety was established with 12 members. Its purpose was to protect the new French Republic from its enemies, and it basically became a 12-man dictatorship with Robespierre as its leading voice. The Revolutionary Tribunal was also reinstated. A special court created to streamline the process of trying suspected enemies and handing out their death sentences. With these two new institutions, Robespierre wanted to scare France's enemies straight. In September 1793, it was announced that terror would be the order of the day. Jesus. In other words, fear had become official government policy. And from then onwards, we enter into the period known as the Reign of Terror. Spies and secret police were everywhere and watched the people closely. France's public had to be extremely careful what they said and how they behaved. Obviously, criticizing this new system or the government would quickly have you sent off to the guillotine. But that's not all. Even the most minor offense could have you tried before the Revolutionary Tribunal. Hello, Citizen Martin. Hello, Monsieur Dubois. Monsieur? Did I just hear you say Monsieur? That's the old style of address, my friend. To the guillotine! You know what? <laughs> I didn't like him, but I do feel kind of bad for the king and his family. Oof, expressing sympathy for the royal family, are we? To the guillotine! Twelve sous for a loaf of bread? That's way overpriced! To the guillotine! Man, this bread line is taking forever! To the guillotine! <laughs> and you, you look like you're thinking anti-revolutionary thoughts. To the guillotine. Max, you're That's sending fair. way too many people to the guillotine. To the guillotine! Chop, 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 <laughs> chop, 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 chop. It was insane. All across France, about 40,000 people were killed Jesus. for suspected crimes against liberty. 
Let's say your neighbor won't stop mowing the lawn at 7 in the morning. Well, then all you gotta do is tell the government they've been talking smack about the revolution. And there's a good chance they'll end up in front of the Revolutionary Tribunal. Maybe they'll even be executed, taking a metaphorical load off your shoulders and a literal one off theirs. The most prominent victim of the reign of terror was a certain Marie Antoinette, who was finally tried and found guilty of treason well, she's in not 1793. Dead yet? She expected she'd be brought to the guillotine in a royal <laughs> carriage, fit for a queen. All the Republic could provide if for you guys can't see because of the chat, she's got an ATST <laughs> in her hair. <laughs> or ATAT, however, I'm sorry. was a wooden tumbrel. At 37 years old, the most hated woman in French history met her end on the 16th of October, 1793. Robespierre had saved the revolution through terror. Internal dissent was being suppressed. The food situation was no longer quite as bad. Even the French military had got its act together again and pummeled the Allies at the Battle of Fleurus. For Danton wow. and his followers, the time was right to try to normalize the French Republic. Hey, Robespierre. So we were thinking that since things are finally going better, maybe we should rein in the terror. And while we're on it, <laughs> we could possibly start taking it easier on the church and also try to end this costly war. Hmm. Oh, crap. <laughs> Don't put him in the guillotine, bro. Don't Pierre put him in the guillotine. For lack of a better term, a bit mental. He was hell bent on creating what he called a republic of virtue, and for him, this meant amping up the bloodshed even more. Throughout the spring and summer of 1794, executions reached an unprecedented level during a period known as the Great Terror. Even those closest to him found their way to the guillotine if they dared oppose his ideas and actions, and he began alienating himself from the rest of the convention. He created a new deistic religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being, along with the new annual Festival of the Supreme Being. Man, I think Robespierre is really starting to lose it. He thinks he's a god or something. Nonsense. Sure, he's gone a little extreme, but he doesn't think he's a god. My children, bathe your immortal souls in the virtue of my republic. Okay, yeah, he's completely lost it. Robespierre's <laughs> ultimate mistake, however, came on July 26th when he made a speech to the National Convention in which he said this, I have in my hand a brand new list of enemies to be sent to the guillotine, and many of you are on this list, but I'm not going to tell you who yet. What do you think of that? <laughs> I so think we should send Robespierre to the guillotine first. That's so stupid! That is such a bad idea! Everyone's going to be afraid of you and they're going to have to kill you first! He'd be the worst Among Us player, bro. All in favor? I know no, who the imposter no. is, but I'm not going to say it in this later, meeting. Robespierre became the final victim of the monstrous terror and paranoia he had created. Many historical accounts of the revolution end here with the death of Robespierre and his terror. But the revolution officially continued for another five years until 1799. So what happened between now and then? Well, Napoleon. after the fall of Robespierre, a more moderate political group called the Thermidorians took control of the convention. They wanted to restore stability to the government. Now, Robespierre's allies and other radicals who had fueled the terror themselves became the target of political suppression. Bourgeois street fighters took on the radical Saint-Culoc in the streets during a period named the White Terror. In 1795, the Thermidorians drafted a new constitution and created a government. Dude, this is like just rapid fire. Everyone that comes into power is just beating the shit out and killing the people that were in power right before them. It's just rapid fire. Someone else comes to power and then gets their grudge out and they cause new grudges and then someone else gets in. Called the Directory with the purpose of preventing power from being able to fall into the hands of a single individual again. As this new government was being established, royalists who wanted to bring the monarchy back to France saw this moment as an opportunity to strike. They staged an insurrection in Paris and battled with the National Guard in the streets. Luckily, one Napoleon Bonaparte happened to be in Paris at the time, and he took control of the situation, firing on the crowd and putting down the insurrection. From this moment on, the people of Paris would never again be able to stage a popular uprising and <coughs> lost their control over the revolution. For his actions, Napoleon became a general and was sent to take control of the French armies in Italy. The new directory remained a fairly ineffective government for the remainder of the revolution. It was plagued with corruption and struggled to keep the economy afloat, and as a result, wasn't very popular. For the people of France, with the strict social customs of both royalist France and the tarragon, they didn't really know what to do with themselves. Men no longer removed their hats when talking to women. Different classes began intermingling, and a publication began circulating that looked a lot like a modern dating app. It was social anarchy. Outside of France, <laughs> the war continued. In 1795, France took the Netherlands, where they set up a puppet state. Then they negotiated both Prussia and Spain out of the war. The British attempted Damn, to land French royalists so in the West to reinforce economic... rebellion, but that plan failed. In 1796, the French planned a three-pronged attack with the aim of marching on Vienna and knocking Austria out of the war. 
the two northern armies were defeated and forced to retreat. However, Napoleon in the south, with groundbreaking military strategy, won battle after battle after battle. He pushed the Austrians out of Italy and began closing in on Vienna. The Austrians freaked out and Napoleon oversaw the signing of a peace treaty. He had almost single-handedly knocked Austria out of the war. And by the way, he was only 28. So maybe yeah, it's about young, time huh? you moved out of your mom's basement. Napoleon <laughs> became a famed hero among Sad. the French people, but his aspirations were still higher. He briefly went off to Egypt and discovered a bunch of gnarly Egyptian stuff, but then the British destroyed his fleet and trapped his forces. Say, Napoleon, sir, you're not going to leave us here stuck in Egypt and return to France, are you? Nonsense, my boy. I would never dream of abandoning my loyal soldiers. Wow, what's that over there? <laughs> On his return to Paris, Napoleon found himself to be extremely popular and the government extremely unpopular, and he started getting some power-hungry ideas. Conveniently, a politician named Emmanuel Joseph Sieyès approached Napoleon and said, Hey man, since you're so popular, do you want to help me stage a coup? Great idea. Let's stage a coup, and then I'll coup you. What? Napoleon, with the help of his politician brother, entered the government chamber, possibly got punched in the face, and finally his troops intimidated the council to dissolve the government and create a new constitution that basically made Napoleon a dictator. So there you have it, the French Revolution, born with the great promise of liberty and equality. The common people dared challenge an oppressive system that had existed for centuries. But before they knew it, they found liberty sidelined by terror, equality that possibly didn't quite hit the mark, and an absolute monarchy replaced by an absolute dictator. Huh. Napoleon began stabilizing French society, he restored the Catholic Church and got rid of that crazy calendar, among other things. But he remained ever ambitious. He was France's first consul, but he slept soundly at night dreaming of being something even bigger. Napoleon's expansionist aspirations, combined with the ongoing conflict in Europe, would eventually lead the continent into a huge conflict known today as... That was a good video. I, I learned some things. I didn't know all that about the French Revolution. I knew like the broad strokes that it led to, like it started, went bad, reign of terror, and then Napoleon, but there was a lot in there I didn't know. When you have a whole series of wars named after you, yeah, Napoleon. <laughs> Napoleon went ham. I think the craziest thing that I know about Napoleon is that every country in Europe allies up, finally beats him, takes him down. They're afraid of him, so they don't kill him. They exile him to an island. He escapes the island, sails back to France. The armies that are sent to capture him, he, like, gives a speech. They all turn sides. <laughs> he gets the fucking army back, rides back into France, and becomes leader again. Then they have to ally up and uh, exile him again. <laughs>